check, check, check. Turn it down just a little bit. All right, guys, can I get your attention? Welcome to this version of Achievers Tech Talk. Uh, very excited tonight. Uh, we have an amazing speaker in the house. We have a really big crowd. Uh, before we get started, just want to go over a couple of really quick housekeeping items. So number one, uh, our meetup group has grown from last month to 1,274 members. So round of applause for you guys for keeping this community strong and growing. Thank you very much. Um, as always, our purpose here at Achievers Tech Talks is to give back to the Toronto tech community. So our all the slides and videos of our events can be found on our meetup group or at achievers.com slash tech. All the videos are hosted there. So if you know anybody that missed uh, the event tonight, you can share it with them or you can repost it on your social networks. It should be up there within the next few days. All right. So without further ado, um, our speaker here tonight uh, is an awesome speaker, which I've already mentioned. Um, and when you think of... Toronto tech startups uh, that have put this city on the map. FreshBooks is often at the top of that list. Um, being in a, an individual that has worked in the Valley before and then eventually moved back here to help grow the Achievers Tech team, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and I'm sure by the uh, just the crowd that we're seeing here tonight, very near and dear to your hearts as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, the CEO and co-founder of FreshBooks, Mike McDermott. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to uh, uh, just first start off by thanking you all for coming and uh, uh, also thanking all the folks from Achievers for choosing to host us and inviting me out tonight. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. It's not every night you get to talk to a whole bunch of people who are really passionate and excited about what we can build in terms of technology companies here in Toronto. So I'm incredibly proud to be here and grateful to you all for choosing to spend your time uh, here with me. Um, so uh, a couple other, and now I'm going to just try and set your expectations just a notch down here lower uh, and just let you know, some of you may be familiar with this wonderful hacking cough that's been going around. Uh, this is the first day I have uh, made it through without either losing my voice or uh, uh, hacking up a lung. So uh, if I do start coughing in the middle of this thing, please uh, just bear with me. I will try to, uh, try to manage through. So. Um, that's the title on this thing. We have morphed it slightly. What I'm going to try and do here is um, I'm going to speak for sort of 25 minutes is my goal, okay? And then I want to turn things over and do more questions. So a little more, a little less structured. I thought that you folks might enjoy that a little more. Also helped with preparing, not knowing whether I was going to make it through a practice run and coughing up along. Um, so, uh, so we've morphed this title a little bit. And wh what I want to talk about and just sort of explore is, um, is the concept of success. Okay, So a few words up there. These things are classically, when you think of building a technology company, these are some of the things that sort of embody or capture you know, what success is. And so I'm going to try and speak to the hearts of folks who are building companies here tonight, maybe participating in companies. And thinking about, you know, these are the classic definitions of success. And what I've found so far is how you define success and what success is all about for you is sometimes not quite so conventional. Okay? So in a nutshell, success tends to be like a second order thing, like achieving that that, um, you know, whether it's an IPO or an acquisition or fundraising, these things are byproducts of other things. And when you're building a company and thinking about how to do that, it's actually, in my experience so far, more important to think about the other things <laughs> and stay focused on those uh, so that you have a hope in getting there. And what I'm going to try and do today is, is kind of talk about you know, some of those underlying things and assumptions, the sort of textbook of how you're supposed to build a company and, uh, and challenge some of those. And some of these things, some of these ways I'm going to challenge some of those might be, you know, familiar to you and, and sort of, uh, um, but, you know, historically would be quite uh, revolutionary. So um, that's the gist of things. So a little bit about me um, just before we get going. So my name is indeed Mike McDermott. I'm the co-founder and CEO of FreshBooks. And, and where I'm coming to you from is, uh, you know, once upon a time, I was running a little design agency, saved over an invoice, built a solution to build my clients, okay? So FreshBooks today is, uh, we're 140 people based in Toronto. We help manage an economy of the smallest small business owners that is tens of billions of dollars, 
Okay, so we help these people get paid, manage their finances, and it's uh, an extraordinarily uh, rewarding sort of experience building this company and serving all these small business owners. And when you think about where we got started out, uh, to even be in existence today, when I was starting out, basically the first question we spoke with anyone was, you know, Intuit's going to crush you. Discuss. Right? Because they had this massive market share. There's this, uh, you know, they built this amazing franchise around a, a company called QuickBooks. And so what we did was we started out and say, hey, we're not going to take on the whole QuickBooks franchise. We're going to start with invoicing. Okay? And we started with this very narrow wedge. And we worked on it for three and a half years from my parents' basement. Okay? And we started gradually signing up more and more customers. And with this tiny wedge of invoicing, and we started serving people and over-serving them with billing and invoicing, serving really small businesses, and soon people wanted some more things from us, and we started offering them expenses, and, and pretty soon we were helping them do their accounting, a profit and loss, this kind of thing. So FreshBooks is a simple cloud-based accounting solution for small business owners. And, um, and you know, our vision is a world where entrepreneurs can successfully run their businesses without having to learn accounting. So before starting this business, I had studied bookkeeping in high school. I was at Queen's in the business program there, very, very good program, studying accounting. And I ran my own business on Word and Excel and didn't want to use the market lead at product at the time. So that's, that's kind of how I've come to here. We just took this tiny little slice and figured out bit by bit how to not get squashed by the big guy and how to start building out some other pieces of the puzzle. Now we're actually number two in North America. No one has more paying customers beyond Intuit QuickBooks, a $20 billion company. Okay, so that's what brings me to, to date. Um, all right, so uh, these are 10 ways to be successful that people will tell you, okay, that I would like to challenge and share with you some of the stories of how we thought about this stuff a little bit differently in hopes of inspiring you to maybe think a little differently about how you do some of these things. So, revenue is the only measure of success. Okay, Let's pound the table, let's all agree, it's the only measure. And, uh, you know, I guess there's all these crazy companies. I don't know if you guys just saw Quora just raised uh, $80 million today at a $900 million valuation and zero revenue. Um, I, I guess that kind of makes me chuckle. Uh, I, I just, you know, I'm sure there's something awesome going on there. It's amazing what the net has done and the amount of value that has been created uh, through services. But that's not really what I'm talking about here. What I want to talk about instead is some of the stuff we've done over the years to measure and track our progress that was not actually revenue. Okay, so when we started out, we didn't have any customers, we didn't have any revenue. And in the earliest of days, our unit of progress was actually shipping things and getting things built, right? And so this is, you're, you're building up early stage of a company. It's just projects and milestones and delivering something. And then it was about serving people. And the thing that kept us going was actually the feedback we got, right? That was kind of the reward for doing things. Eventually, we evolved into trials, how many people were signing up. And uh, for the last, better part of the last 10 years, we have annually built our plans and running our business around paying customers, not revenue, as our core sort of leading economic indicator in the business. This year is going to be the first year where, um, you know, myself, the team, uh, you know, is aligned around revenue as the number. And the point here is. I, I, like the great thing about being an entrepreneur is you can decide to define success as you see fit. Okay, at the end of the day, you got to keep the lights on. You got to get something to market. But I mean, there's a lot of options. You know, you can go to profit after these things. You can go. You can do a whole bunch of different things. And I think what that unit of measure is uh, is is important. It's going to dictate the kind of behaviors you have in the organization. So if it's about you know even just the notion of using a customer as a success measure and a target for the end of the year. Like that's a real thing your whole team and company can get their heads around, right? Your board, if you know the unit economics of those things, should, you know, if you have one, uh, be able to wrap their heads around. So anyway, so, so not using just revenue as a default is just something to consider. 
Um, keeping up appearances. I think a lot of people spend a lot of time on this, and this means a bunch of things to me. But um, I guess we've been on a, like, I get to wear this sort of stuff to work. I mean, technology's like that, right? Um, you, you think about another time, and it was suits or what have you. So this, this is not net new news to you. But when we're thinking about sort of building a brand, when we started the company, we actually built this brand around uh, gray and navy blue and trying to present like a bank. Okay. We tried to present like a bank because we were managing people's financial information. And we thought that they wouldn't trust us if we didn't look like a bank. So we presented like a bank. But we were working out of my parents' basement in like t-shirts right, and shorts and you know, hanging out. And, uh, but we, we kind of had this, I don't know, quote unquote facade. We thought it was the right thing to do to build the brand like that. Uh, went so far as um, my co-founder Levi, who was our VP of operations on the website, we all did customer service back then. He created like a persona called Jeff Francis who answered support tickets. Okay. <laughs> and one day somebody called and asked for Jeff Francis and Levi answered the phone and was like, hello. And uh, the guy asked for Jeff. He's like, hello, it's Levi. They asked for Jeff and he had to put him on hold and then pick him back up. Hey, this is Jeff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, life's a lot easier when you can be yourself. Okay? And so we were able to, we actually renamed and rebranded the company not too long after this. And not because of this. But, but I, I think, uh, you know, there's something to be said for making sure your company is congruent with sort of who you are and what you want to be. Bigger customers are better. Um, this is sort of the understanding. You're building a company, you know, especially, you know, I think this is classic. That this is how you grow and scale a company. It, I'm thinking technology, right? You sell to bigger and bigger customers, but it's true. If you're selling cosmetics and you start out at like a, uh, you know, going out to trade shows and fairs and, you know, community events, you might sell, you know, 20 customers that day, right? And you start growing and then you get a retail chain that's buying your stuff and pretty soon you're at Walmart, okay? And uh, I'll make this real with a, an example from, from us, but, you know, I, there's horror stories of people who get Walmart as a customer because they want the cheapest price and they want the most volume and a lot of companies aren't set up to support that kind of demand. And so, so that's a, an example not related to my own experience. Uh, one related to my own experience is a little different is we were, uh, we were probably five people at the time. Again, still working out of a home. And uh, one of the biggest banks in the world called us up and wanted us to be their online invoicing capability. So flew down, met with these people a series of times. We ended up beating out, you know, public organizations, multi-billion dollar competitors, everybody else, and we won the contract. And uh, won the contract and looked at it. And, uh, you know, as a first time sort of CEO, deciding what to do with this was hard. And because it, it's kind of fork in the road, right? If you take on this really big customer, this is a sign of success. You've made it now. You've got this channel partner. They're going to drive your business. You can sit back and watch the customers roll in. But I, I kind of knew that, you know, if we go down this path and we play the textbook here, we take on this big customer, um, we will not be able to innovate and build product at the same rate. Right, because you're working with a big FI and you know, you're not going to be able to update your software as quickly and easily. And also, you're going to have this, you know, this notion of customer concentration. So one really big customer that is basically distracting you. Right? And focus is a precious thing. And so uh, they handed me the contract and I was like, wow, we won. That's really good. I'll tell you what, if you make the number 10 times as big, we'll do it. And because uh, I was like, I guess there's some number at which this makes sense for us, right? Uh, and so it was 10 times what they were offering, and uh, they declined, and so we passed. Uh, but you know what? I really, that's what I wanted them to do. I felt kind of irresponsible not entertaining it at a certain price, but uh, the best thing that probably ever happened to us was, uh, was not doing that. So bigger customers are better. Um, it's just one thing you might want to contemplate if you're building out a business. The customer is always right. Not true. 
Um, now, FreshBooks is in like incredibly dedicated to customer service. We're recognized as one of the best customer service organizations in the world by our peers of other customer service companies. We won a number of awards along those lines. Uh, and so we, you know, listen, we really care what our customers have to say and we're out there to serve them all the time. But I can tell you there are times when your customers are not correct. And so when you serve the sheer volume of people that we speak with, you know, we've had people call us who were sort of less than polite. Right? And scenarios like that, you know they're wrong and you need to support your team and say, you know what, it's a, we're happy to refund you for the entire time you've been with us, we'd just like you to not be our customer anymore. Okay? No, we're not as concerned about this issue as you are. Your conduct is not consistent with how we want to uh, serve people and so thank you very much. Um, but, but that also plays out when you're managing a product and building a product. Right? A lot of people will call up and say, I want to have this feature or this thing. And uh, very true in, in technology stuff. And I think the challenge gets to be, if you're a PM or a founder, you want to serve all those customers. And if you don't feel compelled to build what they're asking for, I'd say you're in the wrong business. You probably don't have enough customer, customer empathy to either be building product or a company. Um, but, uh, but if you feel that pull, you're going to want to build everything they ask for. And sort of managing that flow and sort of staying true to your vision at the same time is a very real problem. And if you take the list of all the requests you got and just go and build them, you're going to end up with a piece of crap. And so sometimes you have to recognize that despite the fact that somebody asked for it, or in some cases, you know, like in our case, like thousands of people could be asking for something, it still doesn't mean you do it. Right? So customer's not always right. Be successful, you've got to be great at everything. And again, you may know already, you may have had the, uh, the veil lifted on this one, but I know I found it hard uh, you know, as, a, as a CEO trying to find my way, figure out what this role meant. And you know, you're leading a company for the first time, and you, you don't know what the hell you're doing. And, uh, you know, you kind of feel like everybody's watching you and you need to be good at everything or maybe, you know, oh, that's just what people expect of you. You're, you're great at everything. And um, I have subsequently found that not, you know, I, I used to, you know, I wrote the first version, used to serve the customers, did all the marketing. Uh, and as you go on over time, you find there's parts of this puzzle that you're not so good at. And I remember one day leading up to a board meeting, uh, one of our board members called us and he said, hey, Mike, what are you doing? I was like, ugh, I'm creating reports for you. And uh, <laughs> he said, I was like, I, it's just, I was like, ah, it's just so painful, but looking forward to the board meeting. And uh, he, he said, well, well, why are you doing that? And I was like, well, you know, I'm the CEO, board meeting. I've got to prepare reports. That's what I do. And uh, he said, well, no, that's, that's crazy. Why, why don't you have somebody else do that? Obviously, it's like, you know, you don't love doing it. You know, you're probably not super efficient at it. Uh, yeah, you can do it, but that's not the point, right? And so, kind of got off that call and reflected on a bunch of things. It was like, geez, there's a lot of stuff around here I don't need to be doing, and I don't need to be excellent at it. And so you start complimenting yourself. And that's where I learned a very valuable lesson, which is there are people who love to do everything you hate doing. <laughs> you just need to find them. Okay? And surround yourself with them. Because that's a compliment, right? And that's how you build a, a great team. So, Zuck says go faster. Move fast and break things. Okay? This right now is like what everybody says is the correct way to do stuff, right? It's the only way. You just gotta go faster, you know, pivot, whatever. Uh, not sure I'm buying it. I have a hard time when everybody's doing it. I really do. That's just kind of gets my back up. And, uh, you know, I think about, you know, a company like Facebook, I think they, they, they have far exceeded, you know, what I thought they were up to when I saw them starting out. It's really incredible what they've built with that platform. It's a marvel on so many different dimensions. <clears throat> they have one way of doing things, which is go faster. Um, you know, then you look at a company like Apple, which has been around for a long time, you know. I'm not saying the people inside Apple are not working hard but they're working in a very disciplined and structured way. And it's completely different than a move fast and break things orientation towards things. And so the point I'm trying to make here uh, is I think you need to decide what sort of matters for you and your company, right? And so I know at FreshBooks, I'm more concerned with quality 
than speed, right? And so maybe you make a decision to hold off on something if it's not quite right, instead of shipping it when it's no good, right? Or not complete yet. And I think, you know, you need to figure out for yourself, you gotta challenge whatever the conventional wisdom here is. I guess that's the point, right? Because you can do it anyway. Um, this will come as no surprise to some who know me. Um, but I, actually, I want to make it a little more nuanced than this. So we have raised money over the years. We've, there's no venture capital inside FreshBooks, but we've raised money. And I, you know, I, I, there's a real purpose for it. We have a re recurring revenue subscription business. And, and uh, um, I, I think the thing I want to get at with this is nobody likes to write about that. People like to write about, like, oh, they did it all without this stuff. But I, every time I do an interview, I tell people we've raised capital, and nobody wants to listen. They just want to say, you know, uh, this other stuff. Anyways, so, um, uh, you know, there's a place for scaling capital. I think what I want to get with this is understand the role of capital and when. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of folks really believe that raising capital is success, like that's the finish line and the orientation is around that and because I have that, that's like the number one thing to put out is like, this is what defines us and you can make that your thing, I guess, if that's your thing. But, you know, in my experience, you know, what that really is is like a starting gun, right? Now the work begins. It's nowhere near a finish line. And I think when you get caught, you, I've seen it happen to a bunch of folks over the years, get caught up in this process and you can wind up in a place where you're not even aligned with folks that you've brought on or don't really understand what it is that they're trying to accomplish. Uh, and you can, uh, you know, develop enormous misalignment between you and whether it's investors or board members or whatever it is. And I think that that's a very dangerous thing um, because I think, uh, you know, in my opinion, you need two things to be successful in business. One is shared values and the other is alignment. Okay. And if you're not really aligned with what people who are writing checks for you are trying to accomplish, then it's very likely that there will be a problem at some point down the road. Okay, so just just know that raising the money is not success. It's the beginning of a beginning of a lengthy journey, and that can be a great thing. But just know that it is. I think that's the important part. Um, personal favorite, customer service is a cost center. Now, I, you know, I, I remember starting the business. I didn't want to raise any venture. Uh, and I'll say the venture community has come a long way uh, since I started building FreshBooks. But, but back then, you know, Dell was outsourcing their call centers to India. And, um, you know, the way to do things was to not do service. Like, don't even put your contact information on your website. And, you know, the way we see things and always have at FreshBooks is we're serving a customer that's woefully underserved. Right? Small business owners, nobody cares about them. It's $19 a month that we're paying them. And so we love to overserve them because they then go tell all their friends and that works out really well for us and for them. Uh, and I, I think it's very easy to see this as like a non-strategic part of your business, but it just so turns out like your customers, the people who choose to pay you, calling you up or sending an email, you can learn a lot from that. And the world is changing and companies are starting to believe in service and the internet's helping with that because things like Twitter enable you know, all kinds of people to tell a company that are doing a bad job very publicly, very quickly, very easily. Um, and so it's nice to see the world coming around. But I think thinking about this as an asset, not a cost, if you're building a business, is, is an opportunity. You need parental guidance. Uh, allow me to explain. Um, this is, again, it's funny, I put some of these things up here and actually, you know, put this together relatively recently. So it's, I'm surprised at how many of these, when I look at them, things have changed. And it's a good thing, it's a sign of progress. Prior to, basically, Zuckerberg, San, uh, Sandberg, the conventional wisdom was, yeah, you got some founders, they built a the technology, that's good. Fire them, put in some operators, you know, drive the business. And, uh, you know, it is one way to do things, right? But increasingly what folks are doing are supporting companies with, um, you know, with operating teams, right? And keeping founders really involved because that can be very helpful to growing the business. And I think I am, you know, pleased to see that. I will tell you as a guy who founded a company, I thought this was necessary many times. And were it not for the time I've had to sort of grow and develop and learn about the role and how to do it, I probably would have been the first person to put my head on the chopping block. 
Uh, that time may come down the road in the future, but for the next little while, I can see myself uh, uh, sticking in the chair. Uh, it's, it's hard to know what to do here, right? It is. Um, and, uh, but I'm excited to see there is a shift going on in sort of company building philosophy and trying to support founders. And I think you, know, you should think about that. Alternatively, maybe you're somebody who wants to build a company to a certain scale and get the heck out of the way. Then bring somebody in. That's an option. The point is, think about it. Choose what's right for you. <laughs> is this success, really? So, I um, personally, um, strategy is about making choices. Okay, when you choose to do one thing, it means you don't do other things. Okay, and so for me, a couple of years ago, I woke up one day and realized I had just that morning become hell bent on building a world class technology company from Toronto. One culture, one roof, that is our goal. I don't know where it came from. I don't know why it still propels me forward, but it does. I think it's because it's a challenge, right? I think it's because, just give me a sec, I'll finish off and then I'm not too far yet. Um, and, and, uh, and I guess it's like, you know, which is your success? For me, this is not what I aspire to do, is to move to Silicon Valley. Why, why can't you do it here? Why can't you leave something behind? Why can't you build a, you know, uh, help foster a community like the folks here at Achievers are doing with having an event like this? I, you know, I, I think we can have an amazing impact here. I'm incredibly passionate about building a company that takes on the world from here, which is kind of back to the title of this thing. I know it's getting one slide in the whole thing, but, uh, but it's true. And I, I think that you know, when you start to find these things, I've had the benefit of time to start to figure out these little pieces of the puzzle that really matter to me. And then you start to build around them when you're building a company. And that's, uh, that's been a lot of fun, getting clear on some of these things. So um, that can be success. Can be, I guess. So um, when you look at all these things, I think each one of these things has been a battle on its own to either discover that it matters or to go against the grain. I guess that's kind of the point of this, is to, I, I just encourage you to challenge convention. If everybody's going this way, which way are you going? Right? Take all the conventional wisdom. It doesn't mean you have to go against it. Just ask yourself, like, is there another way? I promise you, for every piece of conventional wisdom that's going in this direction one day, in time, the opposite will be the conventional wisdom. That's just how it goes. And how it happens, I don't know, but maybe you can figure that out. In the meantime, please don't be a lemming. Okay, that's all I got. Uh. So I was hoping, to the extent you folks are interested, we could spend uh, a little time just sort of doing some Q&A, because I'd love to hear you know, uh, this is, you know, at the end of the day, a community of folks who are in tech in Toronto and just, uh, you know, anyways, yeah. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Yes? Uh, for the entrepreneurs in the room, like, uh, what were their learnings and uh, tactics that stood out to you when you went from 10 to 100 customers and 100 to 500? Like, between those two stages, like, what kind of stands out to you? So I don't know if everybody heard that, but what were the tactics and strategies used to go from 10 to 100 customers and 100 to 500 customers? It, it, it's kind of, you know, I almost might need a different, you know, metric there. I, I like that you're using customers. Uh, that's helpful. Um, the thing is our customers are different than other people's customers. So consumer to small business to enterprise, very different sort of scale and, and contemplation. So um, I'm actually just having a hard time answering the question. I think the number one thing was perseverance through that whole period because that, that all happened when we were in the basement <laughs> and so just sticking it out which is uh, you know not a super helpful way to answer the question um, I don't know I think that's pretty specific to your company but I'd say okay I'll give you some stuff knowing your customer spending time with them like whether it be doing the customer service or doing research and getting on the phone with them um, 
I think that was probably the most important thing that happened during that period. And then taking their input and, and sort of iterating. Right. Go with that. Yes? That's right. So, <laughs> yeah. When I started out, uh, the question is, I assume you were on your own when you started out. How did you gather the team around you? And uh, yeah, it, it's a real, that's a real potential quagmire for any founder, right? Uh, and so the way it worked out for me was, I built the first version by myself and for a little agency that I was running. And I had a contractor guy, his name is Joe, and he, uh, he, I told him I'd built this thing and he took an interest in it. And together, we actually spent about a year working on it on the side. Uh, and then Joe had a friend named Levi, just bear with me here one sec, I'll give you a progression and then tell you what the actual lessons are. Joe had a, a, a friend named Levi who joined us and um, uh, they were good friends. And Levi actually paid you know, $10,000 to buy into the company. He left a really expensive job and we paid him 40 grand that year, or expensive, sorry. Yeah, he was, he was making more there than he did for like the next four years with us and uh, doing my like, consulting stuff. And um, so that's kind of how the team started. And so if I unpack what I really think went on there, um, you know, Joe and I had met playing Ultimate Frisbee. And so we were working together. We had some shared values that really didn't start out with technology, um, but happened to cross over. And so I had this network of people. I was introduced by him to him by a guy I knew when I was four. And so when you're looking for founders, well, I think about that. Um, uh, the way to do it is to go to events like this and to let people know what you're up to and try and find people who have those shared values. And sometimes it's going to be like you're a member of a photography group and you're going to meet somebody there who's into technology as well or something else. Like it's, it's funny. It's kind of probably not your best friend, but like a looser network of people who are going to deliver uh, you know, your founding company to you. And then how did we get through? We're having a 10-year lunch for a guy next Tuesday. He's been with us for 10 years. And he's a guy who... You know, a couple times I was like, hey, can we pay you in two weeks? Right? So it wasn't easy. And I'm incredibly grateful to him for having uh, supported us through that. Yes? So uh, I had a question on the product and cash book. Uh, usually when you, when you are serving small customers, you have lower values to entry for your competitors. Did you face a situation where new companies bring up, strung up, and competed with you? And to overcome that, did you have to focus more on product or on service to the customer? So, I'll paraphrase the question. I'm not sure. It, it's like, hey, did you, when competition heated up, did you have to focus on product? Did competition heat up for you? Because you were focusing on small customers, you were focusing on monthly payments, which is very affordable for small businesses. So, did you see new players in the market? So, so I think what's really interesting about our market, I'll just speak about the small business market for a while, is like almost nobody has served them in the history of time. There are like two public companies, Intuit and Paychex, that have really done a good job. There's another one, Sage, is over in the UK. But like in, in North America, who have built meaningful companies serving these folks. And if you talk with Intuit, all right, they, um, they'll tell you they have 85% market share. But they won't point out that they have 5 million customers in a market of 30 million small businesses. Okay, so they only have like 15% market penetration. And so the problem for us is a little different, actually. Like there's so many businesses out there and they're kind of evergreen. The challenge is more about getting out to them. You've got to have a great product. You need to find ways to reach them. And, you know, the fact is once you have, you know, if you have a customer-facing product and it's not like a deep technology, at some point you have that product. And then the problem you have is... Make sure the world knows you exist, right? And it, it, it's, it, is, it is a non-trivial problem. And, you know, you may want to seriously consider, like, you know, uh, running naked down Young Street, like the whole thing, just to try and get the kind of attention that you need to, to you know, have people get you on the map. Like, it, it's hard. You've got to get creative. And so we, we've done a number of things over the years. Not that. Feel free to use it if you like. Uh, but uh, to kind of really break through and have that awareness and get people talking. And that's, that, is a, that is a really hard part of the puzzle. So it's not just about product. The product's very important. Okay? That's why you keep customers. And that's why they'll, they'll talk about you. But once you have a product that is a good fit, promotion is, is really hard. Um, yes? Have you gone through some really ugly times when 
nothing makes sense. The product doesn't make sense. Customers complaining, you're having fights inside the team in which direction to go. And if you did, then how far were you in the company from the founding and how you were coming? Okay. So have we had a ton of infighting uh, at parts in our, in our company and, and, and when? And so uh, the short answer is no. Uh, and, and part of that comes back to the two things I believe you need in business to be successful, which are shared values and alignment, right? And if you have those things, things are pretty steady. But you know, we have had some moments, sure. And so we had a challenge where it wasn't clear who owned the product, who was responsible to make decisions in the end. And we had a consensus-driven decision-making process. And uh, we actually ended up getting the guys at Tehan Lax, I don't know if you know them, they're local, they're amazing. John Lax came in and was like, let me understand what's going on here. And he spent like 40 minutes with the whole team talking about stuff, and he was like, Mike, come here. Sat down in a room, he was like, listen, you need to enable somebody to be a dictator. Somebody needs to be able to make a decision, right? And then you have to disagree and commit. We're always pretty good about that in other areas, but not the product. So, so we had isolated that, yes, in the product. You're full of passion. But, um, you know, I think at some point you need decision making. Uh, you, you need a way to make decisions. And often that comes down to role clarity, which is really hard when it's everybody's baby at the start. And so to the extent you can be clear about the roles and what you know, each person's contribution is going to be to helping us build this billion dollar company, then uh, you know, that will help you through some of those things, I think. Uh, the customers and the product pieces, less so right now. Did people drop off? Like, did you have to? No. No. We, we haven't experienced that in our time, but you know, it happens a lot. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for Thank you. Do you have any exit strategies? Do you plan to stay in your role like to the end? Is your goal maybe to navigate through the board and become chair? Like what's your goal in, in the long term sort of so what's my, what's my personal uh, sort of end game and all this stuff? So so where I'm sitting today is like I feel like we have made it, you know, half of one mile on a 100-mile journey, right? And so we're, we're nowhere, right? I, I'm very excited about that. And, um, and so I feel like we haven't done anything yet. And take that, and I also, I kind of like operating and don't know what I'd do with myself if I wasn't sort of doing this every day. Um, and so the short answer is, you know, I'm keen to keep doing this. Uh, at some point, the role may, you know, be bigger and better than I am. Uh, I think that will only happen if I don't succeed in building the right team around me. Uh, and so that's really where I spend a lot of you know my time and focus is hey how do we how do we build the organization to ensure success that makes it actually makes the way I think about it is we're going to be growing our company and the number of people in it and therefore the organizational complexity a lot in the coming years and the way I think about solving for that is just having really strong people in place because if they've you know in some cases done it before or just are enormously capable everything's going to feel smooth to people because it's hard to scale right it is hard. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a smattering of things. You're welcome. Um, yes? Yeah, uh, I just find it really interesting. I, I kind of looked at like, the culture uh, of the company. I find it really interesting that you had uh, big dogs were allowed. Uh, you guys have dogs there. I think you have uh, alcohol. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a really great, it's, it's really a great differentiator from your stuff. Your, uh, but I was looking at like, Facebook, I don't think it allows dogs. Uh, I know that you talked earlier about the architect that you want to build, the brand that you want to build. Um, in your opinion, as you guys grow uh, larger and larger, mm -hmm. uh, does this scale? Uh, do you see the proceeds become a problem? Do you see a lot of changes in the uh, architect? Architect and culture. So uh, I hope everyone could hear that. Basically, like, does having dogs in the office scale when you have lots of people? <laughs> well, down that. So, um, so yeah, we do have dogs. I bring my dog to work every day, and so do about ten other people. Um, so, a uh, couple thoughts on this. First of all, I want to be really clear: bringing your dog to work is not culture. It's more like a benefit. That is not a culture. Okay, that's just a thing that happens. And you need to separate those. Cultures are the behaviors of the people, not the animals. Uh, so, 
that's thing number one. Uh, thing number two is there are companies who, so one of the biggest ad uh, firms in the world, and I can't remember the name of them now, but you know, they have pets in the office. Like, you can do it if you choose to. It's like a strategic choice. But you know, people who are afraid of dogs will probably never apply at FreshBooks. So what kind of talent you're li losing out on, right, is a real thing. Um, you know, there, there are just trade-offs with these things, but people love having dogs in the office. And so, yeah, does it, I mean, I don't know, right? This is part of evolution, we'll have to see. Uh, if I need to start leaving my dog at home because it's the right thing to do to be the shepherd of this organization, then that is what I will do. Uh, and, and we'll have to see, but can't see it from here. More so about the So why do you ask? Can I ask you a question? I, I don't know. Do you maybe you don't, do you consume alcohol ever? And like, are you do you drink? Uh, during the workday. That's no. Do you drink? Uh, I do drink. Do you have beer in the fridge now? No. Okay. Do you ever store any kind of alcohol in your home? Okay. Most people I know who drink do those things, uh, and uh, I know I do. But I go home, and it doesn't mean that I drink all the time. Right? Just because I have alcohol in the house doesn't mean I use it. And this is back to culture and behaviors. If you think that people are getting drunk all day at the office, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for that misunderstanding, but you know, the folks there are way too professional to be doing that. Uh, but there are times, say the end of the week or what have you, where you know, it's you know, Friday after, you know, our phones are on till six, right? There's nothing going on until then. So afterwards, yeah, maybe we do something social. That's, uh, yeah, it's not an advertisement to be like, you know, blotto partway through the day, right? That's, that's not what this is about. People shouldn't apply uh, to your job if they think that's the way to go about doing things, so. Sorry? Yeah, I, I, I would say it like this. If, if that's your judgment call, you'll get weeded out pretty quickly. Right? That's not what it's about. Uh, I'm going to go to the back. Uh, so there's kind of one of those, so I, that's a tough question to answer. Um, um, so what role does a creative director or an art director, like we produce a lot of things, you know, like very creative things. We solve a lot of problems with design. And uh, you know, when I think about a creative director or an art director, those people are sort of expert or masters or very good problem solvers in those disciplines and, and the kind of, we look for certain kinds of media. So it's as important as having like, I don't know what, like a CFO who's good with finances. Right? You need somebody who can sort of manage that problem solving with uh, creative stuff. So not every company needs those roles, but uh, they're important to us. Yes? OK. okay. Uh, yeah, it sounds like you, from a research path, you guys spent a lot of time dedicated to fine-tuning product, and you also have a very customer-centric um, pricing model. So is revenue and profit important to you? How important is it to you? And are you planning to keep the same revenue model or pricing model for it? So revenue and profit, these things are like oxygen in a business, right? And so I was trying to say earlier, like, I think sometimes to start building meaningful you know, revenue and profits, you need to start out with different milestones, right? Ones that are easy to get folks' heads around. And so, you know, our business is primarily, our revenue has come from signing up customers. You know, we're starting to evolve that as we have more pieces and our, you know, more sources of revenue in the business. And that's kind of what's bringing us to transition to using revenue as a number. And then you ladder that up with the different business models. So, uh, or sort of different revenue streams. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, so, if, No, no, no. We have specific subscriptions for our, our accounts. So no, it's not just you choose. There's a company that does do that in, uh, in, the, in the tax world, but that's not us. Yeah. Can you rank uh, in terms of effectiveness on the marketing strategies of what you achieve the number one, number two, number two, number four, running down the street or down the street, maybe the number zero, but there's obviously a lot of things in the 
So can we rank our marketing strategy? So, so the marketing and the effective, effectively marketing channels, what's been most effective? So I'll tell you the first one, right, which is word of mouth, which is super not helpful for most people. But hey, you build something people love, you support it well, all these other things. That's still where most of our customers come from. You know, from there, it's a little bit secret sauce, and so I'll, uh, I'll keep those under the hood. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think those, the answer would depend on whatever business you're in anyways from there. I don't know if, you know, you do something very similar to what we do, but I'd want to understand somebody's business to, you know, before there would be any value in the, the answer. Yeah, and uh, we're not in the capital business division, so uh, I'm curious, I know how business You probably need bag carrying salespeople if you're selling to big technology. I mean, it's a different. Anyways, I think that's a specific question. So happy to talk about it with you offline if uh, if you're interested. One more question. Okay, very good. Who's got it? Oh, those are not oh, the, here. The gentleman. Yeah, that's us. Someone's back. Yeah. You talked about quality. How do you ensure that quality both have So I talked about quality before, and how do I ensure the quality goals that I have are met as we grow over time? Uh, it's a great question. That will increasingly become a problem that keeps me up at night and I work on. Um, so a big part of how I've done it today is you know, basically reviewing just about everything that a customer sees before it goes out the door. So how scalable is that? You know, probably not that much more scalable. Uh, and so then where you go from there is you set up some process and some structure and you have some guidelines for how things can get built consistently. Uh, which, funny thing, once you start stop being the thing that everyone uses and relies on to achieve consistency, and they start having like some frameworks and some guidelines and all this stuff, it's amazing how much more productive an organization can be. Because people are like, oh, I've internalized these things, I understand them, I know what's going to pass or fail. And so you kind of spin that stuff out and, and effectively, you know, sort of scale your taste makers who can answer those questions. By the time anything gets to me today, I'm pretty much rubber stamping things. Occasionally I'll stop them, but it's pretty quick to review all the stuff we have and I basically get to rubber stamp it. It's not, it's not a full-time job by any stretch of the imagination. And so with that, I believe we're done. Thank you very much for having me, Zach. Thank you, Mike. All right, so just to end off, uh, Achievers is hiring. If you're interested, you can talk to anybody in Purple Lanyard. I'm sure FreshBooks is also hiring. Uh, so you have anybody from your staff here tonight. There's a couple of people here. So if you are interested in talking about career opportunities at FreshBooks or Achievers, you can reach out to us after this event. So I just want to take a quick moment, um, given that this is a community. Is there any other general announcements that people want to make about the Toronto tech community from their groups or anything like that? Going once, going twice, all right. So our next event, we're gonna do something a little bit different next month. So how many of you guys have heard of this documentary before? Day job. Amazing doc, we have the executive producer in the house tonight, Murray, um, and we're gonna be doing a screening here in the Achievers office, uh, partnering with a bunch of other tech groups in Toronto. Um, so this is gonna be a ticketed event, um, but we are doing a little raffle here tonight for free tickets for the event. So Murray, where are you? Hiding somewhere? There he is. All right, so you guys got raffle tickets on your way in, right? Yeah? Okay. So we're going to pick out two numbers uh, for a pair of tickets. So each, each winner is a pair. Yes, that's correct. That's correct, right? right. So, Mike, you want to pick? Sure. <laughs> picking one here? Yeah. Go for it. Oh, you had to read two? Oh, I got two here. You need both. That's good. Okay, good. Whew. All right. You ready? Oh, I don't think it's on. Okay. Zero, three, nine, three, one, seven. Anybody? There we go. Yay! There we go. <laughs> you stay up here, yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. 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 Very good. Okay. Zero three nine three five two. We got anybody? Going once. Be in the house. Going twice. All right, gone. Next. Reboot. 
just one. Okay. All right. Zero three nine two eight three. There we are. Okay. Awesome. So we'll come come grab you guys afterwards. Thanks, guys. Awesome. So lastly, uh, our goal here really is to give back to you guys in the Toronto tech community at large. So reach out to us on any of our networks. Um, you can email us directly as well. If you have any questions uh, for Mike, you can put them up on the meetup group or send them to any of these and we'll do our best to relay them to him. Uh, Mike's going to be sticking around for a little bit to answer some questions, uh, have a couple of drinks, and we'll see you guys uh, next month. All right. Thanks.